Next we have Dave, and Dave is presenting today. What's, what are you presenting, Dave? MySQL. MySQL. Uh, I just need a web browser. Oh, by the way, SQLite is free and open source. Yes. You guys probably already figured it out. Do you have a meetup? It's as free as free can get. Like, they're like, this is public domain. Yeah, do anything you want. Mm -hmm. Then they have a little note that says, if you happen to be in Germany where public domain doesn't exist, uh, contact us and we'll give you a specific license for mm -hmm. Germany. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so I kind of cheated a little bit. I'm using this little code share uh, thing. But, but I figured everyone else is kind of talking about SQL and what the parameters are and the selects and the and you know showing demos of this. What I wanted to do was a little bit different and actually show a little couple classes that uh, we put together at DuPont. You guys are welcome to have copies of these classes if you want. But it's a thread safe uh, um, uh, implementation of uh, of MySQL, um, the MySQL uh, you know connector. Uh, it uses uh, MySQL DB for the actual connector. You can Google that and download it straight from them. Um, but uh, this this class is what I use in all of, uh, and, and have been using until I heard about the Django ORM. Um, and now I'm in the process of migrating all of this MySQL SQL statement direct stuff over to the Django ORM. But I still have a lot of code that, that uses uh, MySQL DB directly. Um, uh, so this first file, I just have it called mydb.py. Um, there's a couple of imports there. We'll skip past all that. And it's actually kind of short. Uh, this class is called database. Um, it creates an instance of MySQL DB and just passes it off. So we, uh, the usage of this, of this thing is to, uh, uh, you instantiate database, um, and uh, and and when you instantiate database, you it passes back the handle to database. But then whenever that handle is is referenced, it uses this code here in the get parameter, which then gets the existing cursor connection if it does exist, um, and if it doesn't, it makes a cursor and passes it back. Um, the neat thing about doing your connection to the database that way. Um, and, 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 have, and if it didn't have a connection, notice it calls this get and create cursor, which is right here, um, creates a cursor. Uh, I'll show a couple of things. You're passing it, your host, your user, your username, your password. Um, if you're not using Unicode, just do it. Use Unicode in your database. Make sure all your tables are Unicode. And then tell MySQL DB that to use Unicode and the, the default character set being UTF-8. Uh, another interesting thing that, that uh, MySQL DB does uh, is you can specify to use a dict cursor. So when you get rows back, they come back in a, a tuple of dictionary representations of your rows. And so once you get that tuple, you can immediately start accessing the individual fields as though it was a Pythonic dictionary, um, which is fantastic. Um, MySQL date times show up as Python date times. MySQL integers show up as Python integers. Um, stuff like that. It takes care of all that for you. You don't have to screw around with it. Um, the implement or the the usage of how you would use this uh, this thing called a database class. Um, I have another file here called. Uh, MySQL uh, interface, um, and uh, I guess I wouldn't say this, I'll kind of delete some of this DuPont proprietary comment, hee <laughs> hee. Um, <laughs> we didn't just broadcast that out. Over That's here. all right. <laughs> it's all right. Um, I learned this little trick from, uh, from Django. Um, if you put your uh, error classes um, right there as uh, class variables, then once you have an instance, you can immediately access your exception types for, for exception checking. Um, yeah? I'm sorry. What is happening there? Because it looks like you're assigning something to itself. I am assigning a class 
variable okay. this to a class this this one right here which was defined up here. Okay. So so now anything that has a handle to MySQL interface can say handle dot MySQL interface error. So in a try catch block, if all I have is my handle to the database, I can I can do like try and then accept handle dot MySQL interface error. Or uh, the Django equivalent would be if you have your table name and you're doing like a you know uh, my table name dot objects dot get whatever, and uh, and it fails, you're going to fail with a um, table name dot does not exist, and that's exactly what they've done here. Is in that table that they've created on the fly, they've created a class variable that is set to the name of the exception type that gets thrown for does not exist. Does that answer? Good question. Yes, it does. Very, very, very cool trick. And what it means then is that when I import my SQL interface, I don't have to import all of the random possible types of exceptions that it could throw. They all kind of come for free as part of that part of that import. This right here, they call this a descriptor. Um, and what I've done here is I've instantiated <coughs> database, called it cursor, as a class variable. This is this is the most important trick of this entire thing that was completely eye-opening to me when I discovered you could do this. So what I've done here is created an instance of database, stored it as cursor, okay? Um, then whenever anything reference that any anything within MySQL interface references self.cursor, it goes up to the interface to this guy up here runs it through this get code and passes back the um, the existing cursor if it does exist which would be right here and if it doesn't exist it creates a brand new one and because I did that as a descriptor down here now anything within the same um, thread can instantiate MySQL interface and they get back the same handle to the database, or to the cursor, they get back the exact same one. Um, so I'm not going to create multiple instances to the database. The neat thing about that is that if you have a very decoupled application that needs to access the database, um, you don't have to be passing around your cursor every for every class that you instantiate and every whatever you're you're going to be tossing around this cursor that just gets to be really, really, really obnoxious because now every single init method has used to have a cursor as a parameter because you didn't want to create a gajillion instances of your of your database or handles to your database. There's just a lot of overhead in creating and throwing those away. Um, and this is actually another trick that I did learn from reading the, the Django source code. Um, that's how they do that's how they do their connection to the database. The very first time you run a connection, you pick up this descriptor and then it hangs around throughout the life of your of your thing anytime you want to connect to any of the tables anywhere. So it uses an existing descriptor. Yep. Okay. So I think I understand when Python reads this file, it reads this class, and it runs mydb.database and it assigns that to cursor. And yep. anytime that class is used <coughs> afterwards and the program is running, it gets mydb.database. No, no. It, uh, yes, yes. It gets the handle to, to yeah, it, it the database. The same thing. Uh huh. Um, my question is, how does where does the double underscore get method? I'll show come you. From? I'll show you. So we haven't we haven't hit that yet. Okay. Okay. Um, so here's your here's the init method right here. Okay. It says uh, let me get rid of this hat here. It's kind of obnoxious. Maybe. There we go. That guy too. Maybe. Okay. Um, so this is just some, some logging stuff. Um, I am whenever I create a handle to the database or to to my SQL interface, I'm logging um, the stack minus two, which is actually the uh, the caller, the, the 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 class and the line line of code and stuff that created the instance to the database. I'm, I'm just writing that to the log. Nothing real tricky there. Um, 
I guess if you're not familiar with trace, traceback extract stack, that might be tricky for you. Um, here's a method. Ensure database exists. Um, and uh, this uh, is just a simple method. We don't really need to go through that. Um, it's pretty obvious what it does. Select database. Here, here's the first time we use cursor. Um, when you run this code here, it actually hits the class and it calls the get. So in order to evaluate self.cursor and know what to do with it, it hits the, the DB class and uses the get in order to return the cursor from that descriptor that we created a long time ago. Fantastic. Okay. Um, then once it gets that cursor, then it's going to execute. And essentially, you're using the same thing that uh, that Chris just showed us with that with that same you know uh, make your connection, get a cursor with that cursor, then you run your execute. Um, I have created a method here called query, um, and this is a, a method that I end up using a lot in my code. Um, so if I have uh, an, an instance of MySQL interface, I use that instance.query, I pass it, uh, um, I, call the, I call the variable here cursor, but what, what that really is is the database, um, pass it the SQL statement, and then uh, if I want to, it to do a return call, I can pass that as a string, fetch one, fetch all, that kind of thing. Um, and then params, if you want to use a parameterized SQL, um, you can pass in those parameters as a list right there. Um, repeatable equals true defines if the if the curse if the query fails whether you want it to automatically try and repeat it. Here's some some comments that kind of describe that. Um, this thread safe lock this allows me to run this same MySQL interface with my shared connection to the database uh, as a thread safe. Uh, Thread safe operation because I've locked it, and this set of code here then becomes a uh, protected um, a protected code block that only one one set of code can enter at a time. Um, and uh, essentially, it's it's when this code runs, it runs select database, um, passing it the, the database name as a string. Um, if there's a return call, uh, or sorry, then it executes it. Um, again, using using the same model that Chris showed, um, you know, execute and then uh, and then if there's a return call, I'm doing it through exec. That's bad form. That needs to be factored out. You should really shouldn't be using exec in your code. Um, and if there is a return call, then that uh, return call would uh, would happen here um, through through the response. Um, I'm sorry. It would happen here. This this would use that return call, fetch one, fetch all, that kind of thing. And if it uh, if it works, then we fall all the way through and return um, response. Uh, the try except finally uh, pattern is something you guys might not be familiar with. Finally, uh, if you're not, basically your try block goes. If it goes smoothly, it jumps immediately to your finally block. If it doesn't run smoothly, it goes through your accept block, and then it's guaranteed to also go through your finally block. Even if your accept block um, raises an exception or returns or does anything else, it will still guarantee to run your, your finally code. And then I uh, return the response. Um, one other class here at the bottom is called the database mixin. Um, Fantastic thing about that is that uh, I have a number of classes that need to access the database. I have an inventory class. I have a people class. I have a you know a whole bunch of just object-oriented classes that need to hit the database and find out from the database tables um, information about them. And so I've created this database mixin, so any class can inherit from database mixin and immediately have both a SQL handle and a query property so that, uh, let's, let's say I have an inventory class um, 
and that's going to uh, inherit from database mix in. Um, oh, that spaced for me. Uh, notice that my database mix in does not have an init. I don't have to call super. Um, I'm not really going to do anything here, but I might have a method that's called uh, get current inventory. Uh, within this, I immediately have uh, I don't know where where one. I don't know what we're going to do, right? Something like that. Um, self dot query because query is available to me. Um, this might be in my manufacturing uh, database. My SQL statement SQL, I want to do a fetch all. And uh, I don't have any parameters, so I'm just going to end it there because I'm not setting a parameter as a query. Um, this would be my results. Actually, I can even just go like this. The neat thing about that is all of a sudden I have a tuple of dictionaries of all my inventory. And uh, I noticed that it's going to, it's super easy to drop that database mix in and instantly you have access to your database in a thread safe way. That's really all I have. Any yeah. questions? Yeah. Sure. Can you go back up to where you obtained the lock? Yep. So lock is a uh, class variable right here. Thread safe lock equals threading dot lock. Okay. okay. And then in my query method, um, I have self dot thread safe lock dot acquire. And if two threads try and hit that at the same time, if the lock is not free, then the threads will wait until the lock is free. Once the lock has been freed, then one and only one thread will proceed from that point down. And that is, that is exactly why down here I put, I put any code that I'm worried about failing, um, I put that in, the, in a try block, and I have to release my lock or else I end up in a deadlocked condition where nothing can happen. So that's why my thread lock, thread safe lock dot release is in its own, it's in a finally block. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does that help clarify what was going on there? Yeah, all I was okay. just wondering if you had a wait timeout or if nope. there was, it was just uh, wait until it's available. Wait until it's available and, and frankly this code has been running stable darn near identical to this for six or seven years in our in our production environment. Um, I have added the parameters for parameterized SQL since then. I made my code more PEP8 compliant um, this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but otherwise I mean it, it runs it runs very stable and it is extremely thread safe. Uh, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with thread thread sa thread safety issues when you're programming, but if you try and interact with the database and you're not doing that lock, man, you switch database tables. All of a sudden, you're failing here and there, and it went crazy. <laughs> as soon as I dumped my existing classes onto a Django framework where I wasn't <coughs> using Django ORM, all of my stuff blew up, and so then I added that thread safety because. You know, Django is using multiple threads to access these existing classes, and it just annihilated me. So that solved all that problem. Any other questions? Yeah, Jason. I have a question, but it's not necessarily for my SQL or databasing in general. Currently, where I work, all their databasing is stored in Excel files. I'm sorry. I want to find something, they have to go find the right file, and then they control that to find what they want. My question is, would it be worth it to go back and port all that stuff over to something like SQL? So, so the, the question is, you have a culture where people are familiar with opening an Excel file and using control F to find their data. Um, is it worth it to try to do this and force a culture change on people. Yeah. And uh, I can't give a straight answer on that.
because forcing a culture change on people, especially if they're unwilling, you won't be successful. Um, if people are tired of that process and are looking for something better, then you're ripe for change and it's worth it. But if, if they are accountants, don't even bother <laughs> because they love Excel. And if you're not going to give them an interface that's like Excel, they're not going to do it. Does, that, does that anyone disagree with that <laughs> uh, answer? Well, you're right. You're right to take it up as a cultural question, definitely. Uh -huh. That always has to be a first consideration in any environment. However, you can, and there are tools to migrate and keep it looking the same way to the end user. Um, I think Windows uh, put out some Office front ends that you can actually incorporate into their code. And it, again, lets it remain looking the same way. By the way, the timer stopped for all this, yeah. okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that answers or gives you a, a direction to go in. It's on my general SQL talk. There, yeah, that's right. This is, this is on his... Yeah, yeah. General SQL. This should have been asked a while ago. Okay. If you're trying to get Sorry. It doesn't come up. So, if you So what Chris just said was that Pandas has some slick stuff for import it as SQL and spit it straight out. Yes. Import it as Excel and spit it straight out as SQL. Yeah. Mind you, it will not be in a normalized form. <laughs> By any means. I'm not sure what normalized form is. Well, you will have a duplication. You'll have like one person's name or address if you're multiple places and they might not agree with each other. Yeah. Well, as far as you, yeah, you definitely will have to make sure the data is in the right address format. Before, have to before, but you data hygiene. Yeah, yeah. It'll probably be a lot of it. Yeah, well, that's... I need help. Yeah, I'll be in touch with you too. I've been swamped. Yeah. Cool. Is this for the safety stuff maybe what you're looking for? Yeah. 